and then there's the religion of divine accomplishment. And the religion of divine accomplishment, Christianity is the only one that solves that. The only one. Because God is, Christianity is the only religion where the supreme being comes down and makes a way for you to go back. Whether you're the false religion of, of Islam, or the false religion of Buddhism, or the false cults of Jehovah Witnesses, or the Mormons, they're all works righteousness. Roman Catholics, you're not atoning for your sin. Jesus did that on the cross. It's works righteousness. So the only way to God is through the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ makes a way for you to come to God. Through that cross, friends, through that cross, because what happened on that cross? What happened on that cross was, was, was this. On that cross, okay, here's what happened. On that cross, God crucified his son. He crucified his son on that cross, that bloodstained cross. The Bible says by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins can be forgiven. The Bible says by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins can be forgiven, and we can be washed white as snow. Because on that tree, the Bible says, God made him who knew no sin, to be sin, so that we may become the righteousness of God. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus became a sinner like some false teachers will teach. But what that means is, friend, your sin. Remember, we had this barrier. And your sin, God looked down at Christ, and he saw your sin. And he saw your sin. And he saw your sin. And my sin. He saw that. And so he treated Christ the way you and I should be treated. He slaughtered him on that tree. We see the story all the way back where, where Abraham goes up and he goes to sacrifice his son on the mountain. As his hand about to come down, God stops him to provide the sacrifice in the bush. And that's the intermission. Because on the cross on Calvary, God picks up that, the, the, the knife and he brings it on down and slaughters his son. Isaiah 53, 10 says, It pleased Yahweh to crush him. Not that God's some sick, twisted, cosmic parent that likes punishing his child, but that God's wrath needed to be satisfied. Somebody had to pay the debt. Friends, we've already talked about losing our life. Every one of us here are going to die for about 70 years. Every one of us here are going to be dead. Okay? And so when we lose our life, we, we, we're finite beings, but we've sinned against an infinite God. The God that's outside of time, the God that's outside of space, the God that's outside of matter and everything. He's, we can't comprehend it. Who can know the mind of God? He's outside of everything we know as eternity. You know, that's who you sin against. If I sin against my, my seven-year-old, if I tell him something that I lie, he's going to get angry with me, but he'll get angry. If, 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 I, if I lie to my wife, I'm going to be on the couch for several nights. In front of nationwide boss, insurance, Shane. If I lie to the policeman, I'm going to be arrested. What changed in every one of those situations? The standing of the person of who I committed that sin against. It was the same sin. Now picture this. You have sinned, and I have sinned against the holy and righteous God, the creator of the universe. It's beyond any of our paychecks and bank accounts to pay for that sin. That's why this barrier was here, and that's why the only way through this barrier is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The way through this barrier is of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin, so that we may become the righteousness of God. Did you know that, sir? And that, that what happens is, as he treats Christ the way he should treat you and me, God, the great exchange is what we call it, Christ takes the worst of us, and we get the best of him. It's called the great exchange. Okay? And so we, we get Christ's righteousness. We don't become righteous, but we get his righteousness. Just as our sin is laid on him, his righteousness is laid on us. So that when you stand before God, Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed a man to die once that comes to judgment. And when you stand in front of God, it's reversed. Jesus Christ stands in front of you. And God sees his righteousness, his perfectness, his, his, his righteousness. And that's how, friends, that's how you enjoy eternity with God, is through that cross. And what did Jesus say right before he died? Right before he died, he said two things that we need to, we need to make sure we remember. The first thing he says is he's in agony as the blood was spattered and the blood's fallen and he's dying. He says, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We read over that, friends, and that means, but that forsaken means to be cut off, means to be separated. That's what caused Christ to, to capillaries to burst in his pores and sweat blood in the garden before the crucifixion. When he said, let this cup pass from me, he knew he was going to be separated from God. It wasn't that a bunch of Roman soldiers were going to beat him up. He knew he was going to be separated. And we see this play out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so as God slams the door in his son's face and treats him the way you and I should be treated, that's what makes a way through this barrier. 
And then what does he say before he gives up the ghost? What does he say? He says the three most fantastic words for all of us here tonight. He says to Palestine, which means it is finished. What's finished? Your sin is finished. Your debt is finished. Why would somebody not come to a, a, a Savior who offers eternal life? Why would you want the burdens of the cults like the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons that lay on this word? Jesus says, come to me, you weary. Come to me, you heavy laden. I will give you rest. My burden is light. My yoke is light. My burden is easy, he says. But because man is prideful and our hearts, as John Calvin says, are idol factories, we don't want to bend the knee. Because if we recognize God, which we know, then, then we have to bend the knee because we're accountable to God. But everybody knows God exists, friends. Read Romans 1. So, so he gives up, he says, the Philistine. Now, if he would have just paid for all your sins, which he did, when you turned to him as a Savior, I won't tell you to accept Jesus as Savior. I won't tell you to make him Lord. He is Lord. And whether you recognize him on this side of eternity as Lord, or you recognize him as you're cast into hell because you turned a blind eye and deaf ear to him, you, he is Lord. Nobody makes Jesus Christ Lord. He is Lord. And so he dies, and it, and it just doesn't stop there. That's not the good news, the greatest news. That's good news, right? I said that's funny. You're your great brother. That's good news. But it gets even better. It gets even better, because not only did he pay for your sin, he didn't stop there. That still wouldn't be enough, okay? You, you would be forgiven of your sin, but that's it. That would be it. There still would be a way to heaven. To complete the passage through the sin barrier, the blood, the cross, the Savior, the Lamb of God sacrificed, Three days he lays in the tomb, and on the third day, some, some churches celebrate it with, with the pagan goddess of fertility and Easter bunnies and all that other garbage, but on the third day, Christ rose from the dead. He Amen. rose from the dead. And Amen. what's that mean for you and me? That means that Christ, he defeated sin, he defeated death, he defeated hell, and if you turn to Christ, put your faith and trust in him, in his first sermon in Mark 1.15, Jesus says, for the kingdom of God is at hand, now repent and believe in the gospel. A repentance is a turning away, it's turning away from your sin and turning to God and putting your faith and trust in Christ. And when you come to Christ, and you are born again, and you have a new heart, and you have a new nature, then you get that inheritance from Him. You get an eternity with a victory over sin, a victory over death, a victory over hell, just like Christ showed when He rose on the third day and ascended into heaven. No. Friends, you're not going to find a better offer than this. But you have to understand something. You have to come to God on His terms, not yours. Because many people walking around here is like, well, I'm going to get right with God someday. I need to go finish out a couple more years of beers with my buddies and getting tanked and stumbling in the thing. I need to finish doing this. I need to finish doing that. Friends, James says, life is a vapor. Those of you within the sound of my voice tonight may not wake up tomorrow morning. That's not a scare tactic. That's just a fact of life. Okay? I promise you people that have, that have and listen, let, let me tell you something else that's just going to kind of bring on your parade a little bit tonight. The Bible makes no provision to give anybody a free pass if you die because of an accident, if you die because of yourself, okay? Like I said, we just came from, I was in Charlottesville a couple weeks ago where that girl got ran over by the, by the white supremacist guy. Now, I know Heather Heyer didn't wake up that morning planning on dying, but here's the sad reality. This, this, this breaks my heart to say this. If she did not know Christ as Savior, even though it wasn't her fault, she was a victim of a hate crime. She's not in heaven right now. It draws me back to a story last year. A woman was 55 years old, sitting on the beach in Virginia Beach, celebrating her birthday with her best friend. Freak wind came over, and the, 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 one of the umbrellas they rent impaled her in the middle of the chest, and she died. Do you think she planned on dying when she woke up that morning celebrating her birthday at the beach? Nope. If she didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, guess where she is? You see, friends, life is so fragile. We're not promised our next breath. 